You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Good afternoon, Michael. How are you? I I am doing well, Charlie. How are you? <laughs> I'm I'm very cold. Very, very cold. Unseasonably cold. I shouldn't be as cold as I am. I am unseasonably warm because I just went running a little while ago. Ah, uh, see, I did the opposite. I just ate a giant bowl of ice cream. I bought some ice cream at the store because it was two for one. And now I've been eating too much ice cream and I'm cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they get you. Yeah. Have I told you about my love for Turkey Hill? Like the tea and uh, and ice cream people? I have actually never heard of these people. Ooh. You'd recognize the packaging from the freezer section. Well, uh, see, I never buy ice cream, so I'm not sure that I would. Dang it, Michael, play along here. Okay, sure. <laughs> I would. I'm now sure I'm they're a fine company. Share. Now I'm going to make you do a screen share. And I'm going to show you a tub <laughs> of Turkey Hill ice cream. <laughs> okay. Okay, walk we're... past it every time I'm at the grocery store, but I never look into it. Oh, screen sharing is disabled. Why do you hate Turkey Hill, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to tell you about Turkey Hill and why they're the best. Because I always kind of took like, oh, yeah, whatever. Turkey Hill approach to their ice cream as like sort of like a, a middling ice cream brand. It was like back in the day, like, you know, Briars was the fancy ice cream. Mm-hmm. And then you had like... The trash tier ice cream that comes in like the five gallon bucket. And I always kind of viewed them as like somewhere in the middle, like whatever. Didn't really think about it until I went to the Turkey Hill experience. <laughs> the Turkey Hill experience? Yes. The Turkey Hill experience is amazing. And if you were ever on I-83 up near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I cannot recommend the Turkey Hill experience enough. Make your own blend of tea or lemonade or ice cream even. They have an ice cream lab. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. It's like Build-A-Bear for ice cream. Yeah, and it's fun. It's like a little mini amusement park experience museum thing. Sure. They talked about, without naming Briars, they talked a lot of trash. And they were like, (laughs) other brands that are similarly packaged, because they come in like the same style of package, Mm -hmm. are no longer considered ice cream. They're frozen dairy treat, (laughs) because the regulations to be considered ice cream are this and it was like you know first ingredient must be milk then sugar then cream or you know whatever like it basically yeah. it can't be a tub of xanthan gum which is right. basically what briars has turned into so i was like get out of here turkey hill you're all natural and then they had like their little you know it's the turkey hill experience so they're all obviously selling they're like we make this many olympic size pools of ice cream a day <laughs> like this kind of i was just like holy crap this is amazing that's a lot of rock salt. So I went to the grocery store. I was like, whatever. That's all just marketing. And I like, I basically turned it. And I looked at the back of the box and was like, yeah, no crap. As far as ingredients go, I can read and understand all of these. Hmm. Wow. Okay. You're so unimpressed by Turkey Hill. <laughs> I wish we did video in this moment because you're like, are you done? This isn't even your episode. Why are you still talking? I'm just like, I'm not into ice cream. I mean, like, it's fine, whatever. I can't remember the last time I bought it as an adult. And so I'm kind of like, this is interesting. It's not exactly on the same level as like sports, but I'm like, this is something that he feels very passionately about that it in no way overlaps on our Venn diagram. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so. That's okay. If we were talking about tea, I would have some pretty serious feelings. So their tea is trash. I'll say that. Oh, okay. Some people really like it. I, th- I I think it's way too sweet. Anyway, yeah. Behind the scenes, Michael is extremely gracious to me in that he <laughs> will allow me to talk to him about sports figures in a historical context and at least feign interest. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I've heard of them. Sometimes I know who they are. A lot of times I'm just like, I have no idea who you're talking about, but go on. Right. And then I get to tell you a story that I'm like, I heard this. And, you know, then Ricky Henderson said this and it was amazing. And you're like, oh, that's pretty funny. And I'm like, yeah, right. (laughs) <laughs> and then, you know, you'll say something like, you know, and then they met Elvira and I'll say, oh, yeah, I read about that in Elvira's autobiography. <laughs> then I know who you're talking about. Anyway, ice cream and baseball. <laughs> 
Indeed. <laughs> I got my mini plan for the Bulls, so it's on my mind. Oh, okay. I have been to a Durham Bulls. I've been to several Durham Bulls games. A really close friend of mine who used to live in Durham had a boss who had season tickets, but had mm. those season tickets mostly as a way to like give tickets away to their employees to yeah, like, totally. like a little Benny. So every now and then he and I would go to a Durham Bulls game. And I really enjoyed that because like in person, that was a really interesting experience. Outside of being there in the place where it happens, it holds no interest to me whatsoever. But it's really fascinating to be there and see it. Yeah, their stadium in particular has a um, not quite carnival atmosphere, but there's a lot to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know. Besides sit and watch baseball, if that's not your thing. So anyway, <laughs> I'm your co-host, Charlie Mushaw. Welcome to Ice Cream Talk. <laughs> I'm your co-host, multi-award winning novelist and ice cream neutral, Michael G. Williams. Yeah, I got big feelings. The Galaxy Con Raleigh last year, we talked about Pine State versus Biltmore ice cream. Like we'd grown up mm -hmm. with different brands that we assumed were ubiquitous. Yeah. And in the eventual, technically, the decline of the Biltmore dairy, I just like stopped caring. <laughs> and the fraud and implosion. Of <laughs> Pine State. Ice cream is a traumatic topic. Or legitimately stealing kids' lunch money. Yeah, for real. <laughs> they were. Yeah. Go back and listen to that episode. It's absurd. <laughs> they were literally stealing kids' lunch money. They deserve to be haunted. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to shut up because this is a Michael episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty freewheeling episode so far. That's good, though. It's going to be a lot of fun. Before we get started, it's time to do the reminder. We have a voicemail box. We would love to hear from you. We're collecting voicemails for our 100th episode, which will come out this fall. That number is 919-444-2110. Again, call and leave us a voicemail at 919-444-2110, and you might find yourself on our 100th episode. Also, we just found out that we have a discount code for weekend passes for Carolina Fear Fest at the Raleigh State Fairgrounds, which will be held over Memorial Day weekend. That code is capital A, lowercase r, lowercase c, lowercase a, lowercase n, lowercase e. I probably didn't need to say lowercase on all of those. Mm -hmm. Uppercase C, uppercase F, uppercase F. So Arcane CFF with the A capitalized and CFF capitalized. And we'll have that in the show notes. 10% off your weekend pass for Carolina Fear Fest. We'll be there. It'll be fun. Yeah. And the weekend after that, we will be in Charlotte for Con Carolinas. That's right. I have to get to researching. <laughs> yeah. I need to start working on some notes. We're going to have a really fun episode at that. At least yeah. one, maybe two, maybe more. Who knows? We don't yet know our schedule, so we can't make any promises. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we'll be there more than uh, two sessions crammed into a Friday night like last year. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Also, I'm going to take a second before I start. I'm going to now I'm going to go ask. I'm going to take a second to note that I'm assuming Turkey Hill has in no way sponsored us. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Just in case people think that we're taking big ice cream money, that's not the case. I'm actually lactose intolerant, which is the tragic part about this. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you know, I slammed a bunch of lactate and then mm -hmm. ate a bunch of ice cream. They're not paying me. I'm paying for it in every way. Cash, physically. <laughs> mentally spiritually mentally spiritually <laughs> i'm actually allergic to milk so yeah i get very sick which is a big part of why i'm not an ice cream person can't help myself <laughs> let's talk about bottle trees and their origins potentially well their origins are not in the carolinas but how they are connected to the carolinas yeah no they're definitely around Initially, I was going to do this one and decided that you would likely be the better host to cover it because I'd be like, bottle trees, they're cool. I've had neighbors with them. All right. Blue bottles. <laughs> Long before that, one of my neighbors, like around the corner from us, put up a bottle tree in their front yard. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like really into it. I really didn't know that there was significance to it beyond being a decoration. But it turns out there's a ton of significance and some really fascinating history behind it. So I'll start with, I started to say the legend, but I guess it's kind of the practice of it. It's folk magic, right? Yeah, it is. So it's like both. Yeah. Let me describe its folk magic purpose in the modern day and its origins. So a bottle tree is when you take blue and sometimes green bottles and you place them on the branches of a dead tree. Or you place them on the branches of a living tree after stripping some of its branches of leaves. 
and this is especially true on crepe myrtle trees, mm -hmm. you'll sometimes see them as artificial trees, like metal, sort of like rebar trees that have bottles mm -hmm. attached to them. And that's a recreation of the original practice where you'd have a tree, especially a crepe myrtle tree, you'd strip some of its branches of leaves, take blue bottles, almost exclusively blue, sometimes green, place them on those dead branches and use that to sort of decorate the tree all around. And if you've never seen one, but you're listening, imagine like a holiday tree, but instead of decorations, like like instead of ornaments, it's got bottles sticking off of the branches. According to the practice of this, the origins of this, the blue bottles, bright colors and reflective surfaces will enchant passing spirits at night. The spirit is drawn to the beauty of the blue bottles. And then when it touches the bottle, it's pulled inside and trapped and it's unable to free itself. And then those trapped night spirits are thus prevented from entering any nearby homes to cause mischief or torment or to deliver curses or to bring illness or to cause death, any of that stuff. A bottle tree is a trap for hostile spirits. Sometimes the bottles will contain magically charged or like spiritually significant items or objects like dirt from a grave or stones of particular colors or types or sticks from a particular kind of tree or a shrub or leaves, that kind of thing. But a lot of the times they're just empty. And if you hear moaning coming from a bottle tree, especially at night, <laughs> you might think, and the conventional explanation might be that that is wind blowing past the mouth of the bottle. But the belief is that that's actually the moaning of the spirit that has been trapped inside. Sometimes it's less moaning and more whining. Oh, man. Right? Yeah, you're just <laughs> like some little spirit out wandering around at night <laughs> looking for some home you can deliver some mischief to or cause some harm. Now I'm stuck in a tree. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And if you take that bottle off the tree at night and cap it, then whatever spirits were trapped in that bottle can be used to fuel spells. They can be used to fuel curses or they can otherwise be used sort of like a magical battery pack or the bottles themselves can contain spells. And that's something that is done in Appalachia sometimes. And we'll talk a little more about the Appalachian manifestation of this belief. But then also you can just leave the spirits in there. And in the morning when the sun rises, it strikes the bottle and the sunlight destroys the spirit and thus leaves it empty so that the next night it can trap whatever new malicious spirits might happen by. I did not know that part. Interesting. So they should be placed where the sun will strike them. Run low on ghosts. Too many bottle <laughs> trees. <laughs> <laughs> so looking that up, I was wondering, like, where did this start? Where did this practice come from? You know, because folk magic can be really hard to track down where it comes from originally. And it turns out there's actually a very specific history to this, and it is much more ancient than I would have guessed. Because it appears that it has the origin in at latest the ninth century CE in an empire in central West Africa called the Kingdom of Congo. The Kingdom of Congo was this large, highly organized, technologically very advanced empire on the Atlantic coast of central West Africa. By the 16th century, when the Portuguese encountered them, they had become this very powerful empire with influence over numerous smaller neighboring kingdoms. The main ethnic group in the Kingdom of Congo was called the Bakongo people, B-A-K-O-N-G-O. And interestingly, the King of Congo, the Emperor of the Kingdom of Congo, it was not a hereditary title. It was an elected one. Hmm. They had a council of nobles and leaders. They were sort of the legislative branch of the empire, and they would elect a king when the old king passed away. Hmm. When the Portuguese arrived, they found a technologically advanced free thinking society with complex currency, trade routes, architecture, a market economy. They were very much citizens of the world. And these were, of course, like we have a lot of stories that these were, you know, quote, uncivilized people. But reading about them, the first thing that I thought was they were at least as civilized as contemporary Europe and possibly more so. Because mm -hmm. they were just like, oh, look, people from somewhere else. OK, well, come on in. We've got stuff to sell you and we'd like to buy some of your stuff. They were just like ready to go with market trade. And archaeology now shows the building of towns and villages in that region as early as 600 BCE. So this was a very old, very well established culture. Interestingly, the Portuguese imposed hereditary kingship on them. They required, in order to sign treaties, that they stop electing their king and that the current king's heirs become the heirs and that they switch to a Portuguese model of monarchy. It's really interesting. 
Yeah. They also did some converting, whether it was voluntary or not, to Catholicism. And so there started to be some cultural impact on the Bakongo people immediately. Yeah. Way before the Portuguese ever got there, the Bakongo had a practice of using blue glass or pottery and they would suspend that upside down from trees around a home to capture evil spirits and spells sent against the residents. And like glass making and pottery making were widespread. They were global like 3000 years ago. You know, there's all of this stuff making of colored glass. It's very old technology. It's not shocking that they had that at all. But they had a really well-developed practice of using blue bottles and blue pottery hanging from trees and sometimes hanging from the houses themselves to act as sort of a spiritual protective device. And especially if it was shattered pottery or shattered glass, that was considered like the most potent protection. This is actually tied to, or at least overlaps with, some other cultural traditions and practices that were brought to North America by enslaved West Africans, specifically the idea of the crossroads as a place of power. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, there's like all those stories of Robert Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you have these like blues singers go to the crossroads and make a deal with the devil to become really good at singing the blues. That actually is directly descended from belief among the Bakongo people that crossroads were particular places of power and that spirits would travel those roads at night and gather at crossroads to harm travelers. Another place where they would hang blue glass and blue pottery and especially broken glass and pottery was from trees at crossroads to act as protective devices. And that started with the Bakongo culture in at least the ninth century, possibly earlier. But then that practice was brought to the Caribbean and then to North America by enslaved Africans. I knew that part. Really? That, and that was my understanding of it is that's that was the origins. I didn't know it went back so far. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about something, a practice that's at least 1200 years old. Which is wild that the documentation exists on that. And also paint blue came over with them as well. There is mention explicitly, like a description of this practice in a book from 1791. It was written by this guy named Thomas Atwood. It's called The History of the Island of Dominica. Mm -hmm. I am not going to read his description of it because like real talk, this is even for its time, an exceptionally racist book. That's just... <laughs> Even for its time, this is exceptionally yeah. racist. That's uh, I've I've never heard I've never heard that one. <laughs> like, so. let me tell you, for 1791, it is over the top. <laughs> okay, all right. Like, whoa! Reading it, I was just like, oh my god, I cannot read this in the show. But it was interesting to see it confirmed as a practice at the time. And Atwood actually explicitly mentions that sometimes the bottles would have grave dirt added to them to make them more potent as a trap for spirits. But then there are other writings from like as early as 1776 that note enslaved people in the Southeast and specifically in the Carolinas creating bottle trees out of crepe myrtle bushes. Now, I did a lot of reading from a lot of different sources about this and saw some competing narratives on where it actually entered the United States. The Smithsonian says that the modern practice of bottle trees was mostly a Creole invention brought into mm -hmm. Louisiana by enslaved people. And then that practice spread east and west so that it was common within a few years as far west as like West Texas and as far east as South Carolina. But a bunch of South Carolina focused sites and histories that I read, like way more, talk about bottle trees as being specifically a practice of the Gullah. And we've talked about the Gullah Geechee people a lot, especially mm -hmm. in the last like year. They keep showing up <laughs> in the stories that we're researching. So I figured we were headed this direction and I didn't want to cut you off. And I was just I knew you would get to this point based on my limited knowledge of them. And I wanted to ask. And again, this is just based on our rough understanding, like you and I yeah. and my favorite Gullah Geechee creature. Do you think it could catch a boo daddy or is that too physical of an entity for it to fit with its giant head? Too physical of an entity, but there was mention in this that this could be used to capture specific creatures in Gullah Geechee belief. So just imagine boo daddy walks by, sucking noise starts, <laughs> and then boonk, it just sticks to the side of its giant head and it's just trying to like pull away <laughs> and its little arms are waving in little circles right. and its head is stuck to the tree but it can't go into the bottle it's like me in a bookstore basically. <laughs> sure like i walk past the bookstore and i'm not getting past the bookstore 
it was interesting to me to see so many mentions specifically the Gullah Geechee and then also to see the Smithsonian be like, no, this is from Creole practice. And I think that bottom line, enslaved West Africans were brought to North America and to many different places in North America. And so this is a practice that, quote unquote, started in North America, kind of in a lot of places at once. Mm -hmm. The show How Stuff Works explicitly mentions that bottle trees are part of the hoodoo tradition. And I want to emphasize that it's not voodoo, it's hoodoo. Right, like the old joke, hoodoo voodoo, we do. Yeah, hoodoo is this like syncretic spiritual practice. It's not a religion. That's a really important distinction to draw. It's a set of practices and people who practice it. It also gets called conjure. It gets called root work. There are a lot of different names for it in the South. It is specifically practiced by African-Americans and it is from their traditions and syncretic in that it combines like parts of West African religions. It combines parts of Islam and it combines parts of Christianity. Everything I read made a big deal out of the difference between hoodoo and voodoo. And so I want to make sure that I reflect that. Mm -hmm. Voodoo is a religion mm -hmm. and it combines Yoruban belief, which is a different part of West Africa, a different people from West Africa uh, with Catholicism and other religious elements. And it has like a hierarchy of deities and, you know, and different spirits and things like that. It's and it's also different from Voodoo, but I am not going to go all the way down the rabbit hole that I started to go down when doing the research. And then I literally put in my notes, Michael, stop. <laughs> Hoodoo, like root work, conjure, there are a lot of other terms for it. It's a mm -hmm. non-religious spiritual practice that developed specifically out of the practices and beliefs of enslaved Africans brought to the United States. Also, hoodoo tends to involve the use of bottles, powders, tonics, a lot of like really practical applications of beliefs. And sometimes you can find hoodoo materials or hoodoo goods out of the hoodoo warehouse <laughs> well, <laughs> it just sounded like you were setting up a commercial for well i did think about naming a specific store where i know you can get it except i didn't check ahead of time to see if that store still exists and still sells it so i don't want to name them sure but like if you go to a new age shop or like a magic store or something like mm -hmm. that in a city in the Southeast, a place with a significant African-American population, then you can find hoodoo materials. And there used to be a place that I knew of in the triad region of North Carolina where you could go buy little bags of hoodoo powder and they would have different effects. One of them was like sprinkle this powder in a line across the doorstep of somebody that you want to get out of your life. Things like that. What are you doing? Don't worry about it. Huh? <laughs> just, just walk up to somebody you don't like's house. What are you doing? my steps <laughs> nothing <laughs> right you're not supposed to see me <laughs> bottle trees in the united states have their origin in hoodoo that's mm -hmm. where it actually comes from the significance of crepe myrtle trees is the the like structure underlying a bottle tree that's especially tied to hoodoo's origins among enslaved africans in the torah and in the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, the Hebrews commemorate their liberation from enslavement in Egypt with a festival called the Feast of Tabernacles. And that happens this year. I looked it up on September 29th through October 6th in 2023. It's a harvest festival. But for that festival, they build short-term huts from what are called the godly trees. And one of those is myrtle. And then they hold a seven-day celebration. Mm-hmm. So enslaved Africans, often having been converted to Christianity, began hanging bottles on crepe myrtle trees as a way to continue their own traditions from Africa and to encode a message to other enslaved Africans to say, one day we'll be free, just like the Hebrews. Okay. That's really fascinating to me. That's really fascinating that they used Judeo-Christian imagery and West African practice that they had brought with them to like communicate in a way that the people around them who were not enslaved Africans would have absolutely no understanding of. Mm -hmm. And they favored cobalt blue glass because many people believed that that had healing powers. And so cobalt glass was especially favored for bottle trees. And it just looks cool. Yeah, it looks super neat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just, it's cool. And like you said, and as we talked about and I looked it up, AC number 73 in October of 2022, mm -hmm. that blue for the blue glass is directly tied to the use of paint blue to stop boo hags and boo daddies. So yeah, kind of for stopping boo daddies. Yeah. So it's just funny for people that might not know that one. I moved into this house and the overhang under the front porch was blue. And uh, my wife was like, hey, that doesn't match anything. I want to paint it a different color. 
<laughs> and I knew about that. And I was just like, all right, whatever. So we painted it to match the rest of the entryway. And then I told her about it. She's like, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would paint it back. I don't, I don't know. That's me. I ain't scared of no daddy. Okay. <laughs> Big old head. Probably can't even fit through the front door. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> Dunk. <laughs> According to one source I read, bottle trees in the Gala tradition specifically are also a defense against Plat Eye, who is a creature that we should definitely do an episode about some other time because there is like too much about Plat Eye. I have heard of this. Yes. Sorry, the gears were turning. I'm like, wait, why? Yes. Yes, we should. Yeah. Plat Eye has like a whole chapter in mm -hmm. that book from South Carolina folklore that we keep referencing from the 1930s, too. Mm -hmm. The African-American tradition of bottle trees calls for blue bottles and only blue bottles. And when other people started doing it, they started going outside of the blue bottle requirement. Mm -hmm. And these days, it's possible to find articles online that say things like that bottle trees are an Appalachian tradition. I did not see any growing up, but there's no such thing as one unified Appalachian culture. Really, what you have is every collar has its own practices. And we just talked about that a little bit at Retcon in February for an episode yeah. that will be in the fall with regards to a legend from out there, how when you really start to look at who lived in the area, it wasn't homogenous yeah. in any way, which was, you know, and that's how you get all these different variations where it's like, well, we use green. Well, we use blue. <laughs> yeah. And like there are African-American people in Appalachia and there's a whole African-American culture within Appalachia that is unique and distinct and a set of experiences there that are unique and distinct. But I also found articles talking about how in Appalachia you use multicolored bottles. And to me, that says they're made by people who are themselves sort of lifting this out of the African-American tradition. Either that or they're African-American people who migrated to Appalachia. And then the traditions changed over the course of time and generations. I also read something that I found really interesting for people who need, for whatever reason, that I do not share a materialist explanation. And that is some sources said that the blue bottles might have repelled insects also because the glass was made using lime and that lime might have driven insects away especially when the bottles heated up in the sunlight interesting almost like a reverse japanese beetle trap yeah but these days they don't make those bottles using lime so you know if you're out there with your i don't know la blue water bottle then it's probably not gonna have that effect is balls energy drink still a thing I have no idea. I am happy to say that is even lower on my list of priorities than ice cream. I mean, this goes back. I, I first saw this stuff like late 90s. It came in like a blue bottle it's called Balls, like B-A-W-L-S. Mm -hmm. And it was like ginseng and a bunch of caffeine, you know, sort of like a precursor to Red Bull. Yeah, sure. I'd believe that. But it came in a blue bottle and I thought it looked neat. And I kept one of the bottles. Man, nothing wrong with that. But that's what you do as a young person when you come across <laughs> a trinket. <laughs> I've still got a bottle of Urn Brew from Scotland from like 25 years ago. Oh, you and I have talked about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So through a circuitous series of articles and links, I also encountered an artist who grew up in Texas and said in an interview that he was taught to give a lot of contextual lead in that the moaning of the wind passing over the mouths of the bottles on the tree might also have been useful to chase birds away from fruit trees. Hmm. I mean, yeah, also Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. You know, sure. I hadn't heard any of that. I always just always heard that it came over from Africa. That was my yeah. understanding. Mm -hmm. Bottle trees also were not the only means by which gardens and specifically decorations and gardens and specifically Decorations in gardens made and maintained by African-American people were designed to offer protection and to like fuel magic. I read sort of tangentially because I'm me and I like went way down the rabbit hole on a lot of stuff that like wheels and circles in gardens and even spin wheels maybe were originally intended as protective measures, specifically like spirits might get drawn in and then trapped inside the circle. Bells, tin cans. I found a set of photography by this photographer named Vaughn Sills, and I'll link to it in the show notes. She did this really fascinating series of photographs of African-American gardens and gardeners in the South, some of which were specifically in South Carolina. They included a lot of these sorts of features. Another thing that I read was that, and people may be familiar with this one, the idea of witch balls, glass mm -hmm. globes. Some sources that I read said that they were an English adaptation of the bottle tree tradition. 
there was a house that I used to drive past growing up and they had, we always called it like a gazing ball or something. And they had yeah. it out in their front yard. That is a direct descendant from all of this. Okay. And I always just thought it looked really neat. I mean, we didn't know them, so I didn't like walk up into <laughs> front of their house but i wanted to <laughs> right <laughs> drive past it every day on the way to school yeah but like those glass witch balls they're a sphere with a hole in the top and they get suspended over a doorway or a window or from a porch roof mm. a lot of times those are blue or green also specifically which is one of the reasons why it's thought that that might be an english adoption of this practice okay. it's pretty clear that that started in england but it started in england in the late 16th century early 17th Ye oh witch ball <laughs> right uh, they may have originally been glass floats that were used on fishing nets oh, and the yeah. idea being that by virtue of having been taken into a liminal space you know the water beyond the horizon and used mm -hmm. at that border between the air and the, the water that that sort of empowered them when they were returned back to civilization a lot of magical practice comes down to how do you take something to a place of power and then bring it back you bring that power back with you I found that a really interesting idea. They may also have come from the practice of using like a rounded open mouthed glass cap to protect the edges of other things like a mug. Mm -hmm. Like if you were, you know, in the olden days, if you were going to load a bunch of mugs into a crate and then put it on the back of a wagon and take it someplace, you might have these glass caps that you would like fit over the top, mm -hmm. partly to keep the mugs from banging against each other. Yeah. So it's kind of like original recipe styrofoam popcorn. And according to Wikipedia, a witch ball or a witch globe like that is often the first thing made in a new glass shop. No, that's fun. As the kids say, citation needed. <laughs> <laughs> and according to an article posted by the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, which I really need to visit one day in Boss Castle, Cornwall, England, early witch balls were also set over the mouths of jars and pitchers to keep insects out of beverages. Oh, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And relevant to something that our Patreon patrons got, I believe, I found a citation from a 1933 book in which the children of a family in Germany are described as hanging witch balls and garland on a Christmas tree, which may mean that there is a direct connection between bottle trees and Christmas ornaments. This is the Germans. Yeah. Interesting. Witch balls a lot of times are mirrored and the mirrored spheres that you see decorating a modern yard yeah. or a garden. Those are direct descendants of this practice. The idea being that the convict's mirror effect would attract and deflect evil spirits. And be on the cover of like every 90s alternative album. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thus attracting and deflecting financial success. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> witch balls also get used for divination and a 20th century spin on witch balls starting in the 1930s was the wizard's bowl if you happen to know <laughs> happen to know anybody with one of those back no. in the day get out of here <laughs> it's an open-mouthed glass jar with a bigger opening okay. that's like filled with rocks or moss or dirt or water it's a bowl of with dirt in it it's kind of used as a terrarium. Okay. During my oldest sister, she was really into wizard bowls in the 70s. She had lots of them. So, <laughs> gotcha. yeah. It's just funny. I've never heard that term. And I'm just like, my head immediately goes to a head shop. You want a wizard bowl? Right. Sorry for people to have to explain what that joke was to their kids now. <laughs> According to the same article from the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, it's probably all a corruption of a watch ball which was a glass ball that you would hold up and it would extend your vision by virtue of its convex shape. Oh, cool. Yeah, not entirely unlike a spyglass or a pair of binoculars. I want one of those. I want a watch ball. Yeah, like think of, you know, out in the country where I grew up, up in the mountains, we would have big convex mirrors mounted on light poles and stuff. The corners and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, think of that, that kind of thing. I'm on eBay right now searching watch ball. Nothing's coming up. A final note, every now and then I brew a gallon of mead. I'm not like a big brewing person. It's not something that I want to get super deep into. It's just something that I enjoy doing every now and then. And I say all of that because every time I have ever mentioned it to another person who knows anything about mead brewing, then immediately the, well, you need to get $5,000 worth of equipment conversation begins. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, I have a gallon jug and I'm golden. Right. But interestingly, some of the reading that I did right when I started brewing mead, the advice given was to use blue bottles for the mead. In the readings that I did, the idea was that I would protect the bottle from 
sunlight and from sunlight's harmful effects on the mead. But everything that I was reading also said to keep it out of sunlight in the first place. So I was kind of obviated by virtue of doing all this in the bottom of the pantry. So I think that maybe that's actually a sideways reference to that idea of the healing powers, quote unquote, of blue glass. I'd buy that. Because, yeah, I mean, why not use brown? I mean, beer brewing is the same thing. They say protect it from light Mm -hmm. or it'll get gnarly, which is why beers come in green and brown bottles. I mean, a couple of beers come in clear bottles, but they they skunk easier. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) A couple of literary examples or artistic examples. Eudora Welty took a bunch of photographs of bottle trees in the southeast Mm -hmm. in the 1930s. And then in her short story, Livy, I'll link to it in the show notes. It's available online. At the very least, a Smithsonian article that talks about it is available online. In that story, the character Livy sees bottle trees as part of like her community. And as part of the story, she has taken past a bunch of bottle trees. I mentioned that there's one in my neighborhood. You mentioned that you've seen them a lot. I see them mm-hmm. all over the place. The San Francisco Chronicle, actually, they're so rare outside of the southeastern United States and specifically Carolinas and the Deep South. They're so rare that when one showed up in San Francisco in the 90s, the Chronicle sent a reporter to interview the person and ran a story about this weird artistic tradition. <laughs> in San Francisco. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A city that has loads going on. Yeah. Like every <laughs> culture possible represented. <laughs> they took the time to talk about a bottle tree. That's funny. I think for people that don't live geographically around us or maybe listen to the show from somewhere else, they're really, really common. That's why it's taken us so long to get to them. They've been on the list of ideas like pretty much since the beginning. Like, oh, yeah, this is something we should talk about. But we're like, ah, everybody knows about that. Everybody knows about that. Apparently, nobody knows about that. So thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, no problem. There was a lot about this that I didn't know. I kind of went into it being a little afraid that there was no there there, you know, mm-hmm. and it turns out there's a ton there. Yeah. I was really fascinated. I mean, we're talking literally about a 1200, at least 1200 year old folk magic tradition. That's what's crazy to me is I didn't realize it was that old. I thought it was like, you know, a couple hundred years old. Yeah. Cool. I love it. I love the idea of something floating along being like, going to go home. Let me out. Let me out. Oh, those silly old night spirits. <laughs> well, thank you. I know that we uh, we ran all over the place on this one at the beginning. So thank you for entertaining me uh, in more ways than one. Eventually, the bottle trees pulled us in. Yes. Eventually, the bottle trees pulled us in. Is that a wrap? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. Check out Arcane Carolinas at the Carolina Fear Fest. Hold on a second. I have to hang up on this call. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Uh, no, I no, I just hung up. No, I had to hang up on a call that was coming oh, okay. in. Okay. <laughs> uh, check out Arcane Carolinas at Carolina Fear Fest. You can get 10% off your weekend pass using code Arcane CFF. That's capital A, capital CFF at the end. Arcane CFF. You'll get 10% off your weekend pass for Carolina Fear Fest. Check the show. Yes. Notes. Thank you. And the weekend after will be at Con Carolinas in Charlotte. Yes. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating, leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind the scenes info, pictures, videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut, check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our Patreon, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all that in one place, including the merch store. Buy a shirt. Clothe your body. Drape your body in our wares. (laughs) Be our living billboards. Uh, Let's see. I want to... This is great radio. Um... (laughs) Let's talk about today's topic, which is bottle trees. Yes, bottle trees. Sorry. I'm still <laughs> laughing about the little noise that yeah. I made. I was <laughs> distracted you. That's not I'm going to tell you that that, A, you did that on purpose, and B, that's definitely going to be the stinger. So. <laughs>
I sometimes wonder, do people like actually listen all the way through the credits and everything and hear the stingers? And I'm assuming it's a pretty small percentage of people who do. But those people, I love them. If you're listening to this right now, <laughs> this is now going to be the world's longest stinger. If you're listening to this right now, I think you're the best. There you go. And I appreciate you too, because I say and do a lot of dumb stuff. And then usually it winds up in the end. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I mean, not dumb, you know, but I do too. Yeah. Like plenty of, plenty of stingers are me messing something up. I have fun. I don't care if it's silly. Yeah. So let's talk about bottle trees. <laughs> you can't even get it out. I can't. can't okay. even. All right. All right. I'm going to collect myself now. I'm going to draw on my performance studies degree. Let's talk about bottle trees. <laughs> 